It may surprise you to learn that everything in the universe emits some kind of light. It's just not the kind of light we're used to thinking about. The sun, for example, our star, emits visible light. That's why our eyes evolved to detect that kind of light. But that's not the whole story. I'm sure you're familiar with all the different kinds of visible light, all the colors from violet to red. But there are actually lots of other kinds of light that our eyes aren't sensitive to. The reason all the colors of light are different is that they have different energies. And what you see here is that the light has different wavelengths. The blue light, for example, has a higher energy, so it has a shorter wavelength. The red light, on the other hand, has less energy, so it has a longer wavelength. But that's just the light we can see with our eyes. That's not all there is. The shortest wavelength light are gamma rays, which can have wavelengths smaller than an atom. The longest wavelengths are radio waves, which can have wavelengths larger than the entire Earth. The kind of light an object emits depends on its temperature. We're used to thinking of something hot giving off light. But it might surprise you to learn that objects that are cooler, like myself, give off a kind of light too, and that's what a night vision camera can pick up. That sort of light is called infrared light. The world sure looks a lot different in infrared light. Remember that what you're actually seeing is temperature. So something that's warm is going to look bright in the infrared. And something that's cold looks dark. Ice cream. Blow dryer. And infrared radiation is actually a measurement of temperature. Places on my face that are cold, like my nose, appear dark in an infrared camera because they're giving off less infrared radiation. And places that are warm, like my mouth, or the hair next to my head, are brighter because they're warmer. You can even see my breath and my nose if you look carefully. And this is an ice cube. The universe. From the glowing wisps of nebula to the shine of newborn stars from blazing galaxies to the warm embrace of our own sun, the universe has dazzled humanity for all time with its brilliance. However, the universe is mostly space, and that space is cold, very cold. But that doesn't mean there isn't anything to see. When observed in a special way, even cold things glow like these strangely colored blobs. They aren't exotic cosmic objects at all, nor will they ever fill a room with their light. Even these ice cubes emit radiation we can detect, infrared radiation. Infrared radiation is created by the motion of atoms and molecules that are in matter. So even objects that we think of as being very cold, such as ice cubes, emit radiation. Like ice cubes, the coldest things in space emit radiation. And with special instruments, we can detect this radiation to reveal a dazzling universe of unseen wonders. Legions of galaxies and what lies within their cores. The secrets of seemingly empty space the birthplace of stars, and even the birthplace of planets, planets like ours. How do we see these things? With the Spitzer Space Telescope, the last of the four great observatories. Spitzer's greatness is not due to its size. With a mirror less than three feet across, it is easily dwarfed by the other great observatories, Hubble and Chandra. But despite its modest stature, Spitzer's infrared observations are a thousand times more sensitive than any ever made. That's because it does its work 
in the frigid depths of space. Positioned in a unique orbit, a million miles distant, Spitzer trails the Earth like a lone sentinel, following us as we journey around the Sun. Here in the deep freeze of space, Spitzer is far from anything that would interfere with its infrared vision. By gazing into the distant reaches of space-time, or perhaps somewhere nearby in our own galaxy, photons are gathered by Spitzer's mirror. From here, the photons can be directed to different instruments that are frozen in liquid helium so they don't emit infrared radiation that would interfere with the observations. With a photometer, spectrometer, and cameras, observers can count, characterize, and make images with the infrared energy from sources, allowing us to see what has never been known. They can see stars that are invisible to our vision they can sense vast, invisible clouds of matter and reveal what they are made of. They can reveal dust around stars, dust that is forming planets like ours. And they can detect galaxies in the deepest reaches of space-time. Main engine start and liftoff of the Delta II. Launched in August of 2003, Spitzer has completed its primary mission to establish a legacy of new information about our universe, the Spitzer Legacy. How do stars form? What causes them to form? How do solar systems form? Do all stars have solar systems? Are there any solar systems like ours? Are there many? Are there few? What does our galaxy really look like? Are new stars forming in our galaxy? Where? Why did galaxies form? Were the first galaxies like our galaxy? Why are galaxies where they are? How did the structure of the universe form? These are questions that the Spitzer Legacy Program is designed to address. Using Spitzer's unprecedented infrared vision, six programs focused on different aspects to fill gaps in our knowledge. Two Legacy Programs used Spitzer's unparalleled ability to detect dust and other cold matter to help us understand the evolution of stars and planets. One was given the name C2D. C2D stands for cores to disks. And to understand what I mean by that, I need to back up a little bit and describe uh, how we think stars and planets form. The stars and planets form out of the material between the stars, what we call interstellar space. And the immediate problem you come to is that stars uh, are a lot denser than the material in interstellar space. Uh, a typical star like the sun has an average density about like water. So if I took uh, a box about the size of a sugar cube, I'd have about 10 to the 24th power particles in that box uh, for an average piece of the sun. Uh, and if I took an average part of interstellar space, I'd have about one particle in there. So we're talking about a huge increase in density, which can only be achieved by taking a big volume and a lot of matter, therefore, at low density and shrinking it down. So the places where this happens are called molecular clouds. Uh, so they are relatively denser regions. They may be 100 to 1,000 times denser than the general uh, interstellar space. And they're composed primarily of molecules and dust. And so within these clouds, there are particularly even denser regions Still very low density compared to what we need, but, but maybe, you know, 10,000 times the average interstellar medium. And uh, those are called cores. They are sort of condensed regions within the clouds, and those are the places where we think stars either will form or, or are forming now. 
So that's the cores part, of course, to disks. Now, as, uh, as these cores collapse to form stars, if they have even a little bit of initial rotation, they will begin to spin faster as material falls in. This is exactly the same thing that happens when an ice skater goes into a spin, pulls her arms in, and actually speeds up. It's, it's due to the conservation of angular momentum. So as these things uh, collapse, as this material falls in to become a star, some of it actually doesn't fall into the star. In fact, most of it falls into a disk-like structure around the star. And the star grows from material going through the disk and going onto the star. But what's really interesting is what's left in the disk, because that's what you have to make planets out of. So our planets uh, in our solar system are thought to have formed in one of these rotating disks around the young sun. So our project from cores to disks is to try to study this process from the stage of the cores all the way to the early stages of the disks. There are other programs that are then following that further to even older stages. The way the C2D program is designed to, to uh, achieve these goals is to have uh, a balance between selected targets and more uh, unbiased searches. So let me start with the selected targets, which start with known regions of cores. So these are already known to be somewhat dense. Some have already formed some stars, and others are uh, what we call starless. As far as anybody knew that before we started this project, they had no uh, stars in them. And so we study those and look to see what are their properties, uh, which we can learn with Spitzer, and also to, to make sure they're really starless. We also look at already known stars that are a little further along. They've come out of the collapse process. They still have their disks around them. And we're looking at the properties of those disks. And then finally, we look at things that are a little bit further along. And, and until now, we didn't know if they had any disks, but they might have disks that had not previously been seen. Now, because that might lead to some uh, bias in favor of things we already know about, we're also taking a step back and scanning some uh, five of the nearby very large clouds in a, in a less biased way so that we'll find whatever is in there and get a, a sort of a bigger view of uh, what are the regions where stars form and how many cores are there and things like that. There are three instruments on Spitzer. Two of them are cameras, and we're using those to cover these clouds and to look at the well-known cores and the stars. Now, there's also a set of objects that we're already known to be interesting that we are looking at with the third instrument, the infrared spectrometer. And that is to try to understand the nature of the dust and ice that is surrounding these forming stars, both early in the process when you have material falling in and then later when this material is in a disk. So we're using all of the instruments, and we were, we're saving about half of our time with the infrared spectrometer to do follow-up studies of objects that we find in the large, unbiased searches uh, in the large clouds. So the large clouds that we're looking at are all about 300 to 500 light years away, and they lie outside a region that the sun is in called the local bubble. This local bubble is a result of supernova explosions in the past. So there are no molecular clouds very close to the sun because the region around the sun is very low density and very hot. And on the outskirts of this bubble are where all these clouds are. So they're essentially all around uh, in, in the galaxy we're looking at these clouds. And we're covering some pretty big areas. The big clouds are, are something like uh, 10 or 20 times the size of the full moon. So we are mapping big areas, and that's one of the things that you simply could not uh, do before with the kind of sensitivity that Spitzer has. Um, the objects that we're looking at are, are often very cold, uh, and so they, are, they emit at long wavelengths. Essentially, if you think about the, uh, the coal, coils of a toaster, they're glowing red, but they're actually uh, emitting most of their energy in the infrared. That's what's heating up your toast. And uh, we're looking at things that are, that are essentially very cold. If you didn't turn on your toaster at all, um, or if you cool things down in liquid nitrogen, or even if you cool things down to liquid helium. So you're getting to the point of being only a few degrees above absolute zero. Those are some of the regions that we're trying to study. Now, when you try to study those, uh, if your telescope is at the temperature of the room, it's actually emitting very copiously in the infrared. And so the, the essential feature of Spitzer is that it is cooled to also to nearly absolute zero. And this means that the emission from the telescope is, is much lower than if you tried to do this with a normal ground-based telescope. And so that, in addition to the incredible detectors that have been made for Spitzer, is what gives it a, a huge increase in sensitivity. That is, it can detect much weaker signals than could be detected before. You can look. Uh, as long as you like with uh, visible light and you won't see what's going on in these regions. You have to look in the infrared and longer wavelengths. 
And so uh, Spitzer is just an incredible tool to allow us to, to do that, to probe through the dust. And, and the reason you can't see things in visible light is that these form in clouds of dust and gas, as I mentioned. And the dust is very good at blocking out the visible light. So as, as the star forms in the center, then you begin to get more emission at shorter wavelengths, essentially like the, the toaster. Uh, but before it forms, you'll have emission only at very long wavelengths. So we need the longest wavelengths with Spitzer in order to see those objects at all. And we're adding to that a lot of work done by people with ground-based telescope looking at even longer wavelengths. So it's the putting together the picture at all the different wavelengths that tells us what's going on. And uh, one of the uh, surprises that we've come up with so far is that when we looked at some of these cores I mentioned earlier that we called starless cores, they were starless in the sense that no previous telescope had seen any evidence of anything forming there. And uh, we were very surprised. The first one of these we looked at, which was quite nondescript, and we had no particular reason to suspect anything was going on there, turned out to have a, quite a strong source for Spitzer. We found that there's actually a uh, luminous source in there. Uh, and this source is extremely interesting because nothing was suspected there before. And it's a source that's putting out very little energy. Uh, and so one possibility is that this is uh, the very earliest stage in the formation of a star that's been seen. Now we've done a lot of follow-up studies of this particular region now, and it does look like it has some of the properties of uh, star forming uh, regions, but, uh, but they're all very scaled down. So it, this is all consistent with the idea that it's a very young object, and yet it already has around it uh, something that looks like a disk. So we, we looks, it looks like disks form quite early in the process of forming a star. And so it was undetectable by, with previous instruments. So this is a case where the sensitivity of Spitzer being so much better uh, makes easy something that was impossible before. So now we're finding out that some of the cores that we thought had nothing in them actually do have something forming in them. And, and this is quite a, a revolution in the field. The whole story of stellar evolution is worked out in, in considerable detail with the exception of understanding the very beginnings and the very endings. So the, the formation of stars is very poorly understood. We will really be able to put the picture together to have a much more complete uh, a story about how stars and planets form. And uh, as part of that, the, the other hope is that we'll find some surprises. And, and so far, at least, that's turned out to be true. We are finding a few surprises. To explore the evolution of planets, another program focused on later stages in stellar development. It was called FEPS. FEPS stands for the Formation and Evolution of Planetary Systems. The Formation and Evolution of Planetary Systems captures the overall goals of our program in that we are looking at stars uh, that are very much like the Sun and at a different ages in their evolutionary paths uh, in their lives as stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, the formation aspect is really trying to study the formation of planets uh, and trying to explain our own uh, solar system and understand a bit more uh, how the planets came to be and how common they might be around stars like our Sun in the Milky Way galaxy. And the evolutionary component is in that we are looking at these stars as a function of age and trying to trace out the diversity of planetary uh, evolutionary paths of planetary systems. Our best estimates now of how uh, planets form around sun-like stars uh, start from the very earliest stages of the star formation process. In fact, it seems that almost all stars, when they form, are accompanied by circumstellar disks of material. Uh, material uh, in rotation around a star collapses to form a disk of material, and that's the nebular theory of our own solar system and probably how our planets are formed out of a, a gas and dust disk. Our challenge now is to look at what we have from the solar system record and compare it to observations of other stars out in the Milky Way. The real challenge of a program like ours is to take many stars like the Sun at different evolutionary phases and try to string them together to create a movie or, or an evolutionary picture of how one set of objects might have evolved into the other and eventually resulted in something like our solar system at 5.4 billion years that we see today. Our program is roughly 330 sun-like stars, a very narrow range of star masses focused on the sun. 
and we are studying them at age ranges that are spaced equally from 3 million years old all the way up to 3 billion years old. We, we focus in more on the younger phases than on the older phases because that's where most of the action is. Uh, within the first few hundred million years is when we think the planets form. Uh, so we have roughly 50 stars in, in age ranges that are factors of three. So three to 10 million, 10 to 30, 30 to 100. And we focus on about 50 stars in each group. Our goal in the program is to measure the distribution of gas and dust in those systems as a function of the radius in the disk and as a function of age. Models indicate that young protoplanetary disks will have a uniform distribution of very fine dust, almost like smoke particles surrounding the star while older disks will have a different distribution of material because gravity has had time to bring the dust together to make bigger and bigger particles and chunks and maybe planets. Spitzer can look for evidence of this material by detecting the energy coming from different material in disks, from very hot to very cold. At the shortest wavelengths, we're tracing the hottest material in the circumstellar disk, uh, all the way to the point where the grains themselves actually vaporize if they reach temperatures higher than that. Uh, that corresponds to a temperature of about 1400 degrees Kelvin. That is probably about as hot as the hottest, whitest things you would see in a fire, in a very hot fire, just as, as uh, metals and other things are melting in the inner parts of that fire. Uh, in the outer ranges of the circumstellar disk, the coldest material that we're sensitive to has temperatures between 30 and 50 on that scale of Kelvin. This is very, very cold, colder than the, any conditions that uh, obtain here on the Earth, and approaching the, the three degrees Kelvin, which radiation left over from the Big Bang that permeates the universe. So any objects that, that we're familiar with, any kinds of gases would be frozen uh, at those temperatures and are very, uh, very cold temperatures indeed. The FEPS scientists use Spitzer to graph this range of temperatures detected in different systems. A star without a disk has a spectrum that looks like this, with most of the energy being given off at high temperatures from the burning starlight. A star with a young disk around it produces a spectrum that looks like this. The fine dust disk is heated by the star and gives off energy at lower temperatures than the star. So Spitzer detects the starlight along with the low temperature energy coming from the disk. A star with a belt of material around it, which models indicate is evidence of planet formation, has a distinct spectrum that looks like this. This spectrum has two or maybe more peaks. One peak is the hot energy from the star, and the others are from the cooler material in orbit around the star. The dips in the spectrum indicate gaps in the disk, places where there is little or no material in the disk, which might indicate a system with rings of material around it. By using Spitzer's unprecedented sensitivity to detect planetary disks like never before, the FEPS project promises to give us a new understanding of how our Earth came to be, and may ultimately tell us just how common are planetary systems like our own. What we have started to see in our database from Spitzer so far is that the younger systems tend to have more massive dust disks spread out over a larger range of radii in the disk, and we infer that from the temperatures of the material that we see. It seems as though the disks are evolving from the inside out in that at the early phases you start to lose material in the innermost radii and at the older ages you, it's more common to still see material at the larger radii. And a good example is our own solar system in fact. So if we were to observe our solar system from afar we would see an outer belt of dust, a large evacuated region, and an inner belt of dust, a very clear signature. 
we have a model for how we think our own solar system evolved, how its dusty production uh, uh, evolved in time, and we have estimates of what it might have looked like were we able to observe it at an age of 10 million years, 100 million years, 1 billion, and so on. And that is the model that we are benchmarking our data against. We have 50 objects in each age range of interest, and we're trying to look at not just the mean behavior of sun-like stars in those different age ranges, but also the range of possible behaviors. And we're using our model of our own solar system's evolution as a guide. Our ultimate goal is to understand whether our solar system was common or rare in the history of the Milky Way galaxy. Our short-term hopes are that Spitzer really will provide us a unique list of targets that will stand the test of time and be real touchstones for our understanding of the formation and evolution of planetary systems. These really unique individual objects that we can then go and look with other of NASA's great observatories as well as our wonderful ground-based telescopes as well that will provide really exciting discoveries of a few individual interesting objects. But it is really this overall statistical uh, approach from our program, which really is the backbone and defines the basis of the FEPS project. There are many ways in which our solar system can be common or rare. You could ask whether or not planets like Jupiter are common or rare, whether or not planets like Earth are common or rare. And I believe that Spitzer, for the first time, is going to give us the, an answer to a question that is universally interesting. And it, at the moment, we're stuck with looking at the distribution of dust disks in time. But it really provides a first glimpse into answering more subtle questions. And this leads on a roadmap into the future in the next 10, 20, 50, and 100 years of answering that general question, whether we are common in the Milky Way galaxy or not. Roads uh, like our study for the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope lead to the Terrestrial Planet Finder mission and whether we might eventually look for not just Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars, but signatures of life in non-equilibrium chemistry or funny uh, molecular abundances in their atmospheres. And this is a question I think that has haunted uh, uh, people ever since we've looked up into the night sky and thought about whether we might be alone in the universe or not.